much. Go ahead. Good morning, everybody. It, Good morning. It's always so nice to be here. It's, it, I was thinking this morning, it's kind of like coming into bed in my favorite jammies with fresh sheets and just the right amount of blanket. It's like, uh, that it's, good? It's, yeah. <laughs> I, I just relax when I'm here. So I, I miss being here. We do love you. Well, thank you. So I was thinking that last week seemed like to be a collision of contradictory events. We had Swifties watching the Super Bowl. <laughs> Tracy Chapman singing country music. And Valentine's Day meets Ash Wednesday. <laughs> and nobody could answer the question for me, do you still wear your ashes on your forehead during your Valentine's Day? But no, no one even touched that one. So. <laughs> But today, I think most importantly, is that we're continu continuing a singular focus on the significance of Black History Month. For me, it feels really, um, I think the, the intellectual term is bodacious. <laughs> uh, and maybe audacious for me as a white woman to stand up here and even touch on the subject of black history. Um, so I decided that the best black history that I can share with you is the up close and personal history of my life. So when Mary did share with me the topic of Black History Month, I immediately thought of the passage in the Christian got a book of Galatians 3.28 and it may well have been used in the weeks before me but uh, it's one in which the Apostle Paul is said to have written there's neither Jew nor Gentile neither slave nor free nor is there male and female for you are all one in Christ or to shorten that in the, to the words of George Fox, there is the light of God in everyone, that of God in everyone. So during this month that we do honor the rich tapestry of African-American contributions to our shared history, the, these words remind us that in the eyes of the divine, there's no distinction of skin color or social status or gender. We are all equal members of the human family. And our diversity to me is a testament of the creativity of whatever created us. Um, I remember when my children were little and we had to fill out paperwork reams of paperwork every year and it would come to the box of race and I always put human. Mm -hmm. So throughout Black History Month we take this time to pause and recognize and celebrate the unique and vast contributions of our African American brothers and sisters to humanity, all of humanity. This past Tuesday, my colleague from Guilford that I mentioned, James Shields, he's a, an amazing historian and singer. Talk about spirituals. Who, uh, James shared many notable stories with us about the Underground Railroad including the large community of what was called Quaker Free Blacks that lived within view of the tallest building at Friends Homes. Uh, it was just on the edge of what is now the airport. You knew that if you could make it to that community, you could find safety if uh, you were on the Underground Railroad. I hope that you'll watch his presentations on 
the Friends Homes Life Enrichment ch YouTube channel when I get it uploaded. <laughs> it, takes, it should be later this week. It takes a long time to, to do that. And it, you will hear me crying in the background as, as he is singing this beautiful um, spiritual out of the silence. He, he starts singing. It was, it was amazing. But in the struggle for civil rights and social justice over the centuries, they didn't call it that centuries ago, many individuals inspired by their faith have worked tirelessly to break down the barriers of inequality. Some of you here may be descendants of those Quakers who worked diligently and at risk for their own life and limb as early as the 1700s to abolish slavery and to free Africans brought here against their will. In more recent past decades, people like what Maya Angelou called Martin King, because she knew him so well, <laughs> uh, Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks, Bayard Rustin, Quaker, <coughs> Uh, and countless, and I believe many nameless others, have embodied the spirit of justice and equality that is at the very core of the teachings of Jesus. I'm sure that each of us can relate stories where our white lives have been changed by our relationships with our black brothers and sisters and I want to share with you a few not-so-easy stories from my past that continue to echo in my spirit and, and rattle my soul still. So as a newly married 18-year-old man in 1950, my daddy worked in a business his, family sta his, his father started, High Point Auto Auction. His closest working companion was a black man about his age by the name of Leroy. <coughs> From that time until my father's death 30 years later, Leroy and my father were constant companions working together in the car business. So if my father got a different job, he would be sure to bring Leroy with him and make sure he got paid better than he was getting paid at his last job. Our family grew close to Mr. Leroy and later on his wife, Miss Addie. They would come to our house from time to time on Sunday afternoons to check up on us. One day, when my twin sister and I were four years old, Mr. Leroy came to our house to bring my mother's car back to her from the repair shop at the car lot where he and my father worked. The next step was how it was to get Leroy back to work. So what ensued was a back and forth conversation between my mother and Leroy as we all stood out in the driveway about who was going to sit where <laughs> on the ride back to work. We don't think about those conversations anymore. Well, Mr. Leroy suggested that, I think he insisted, that he sit in the back seat while my twin and I sat in the passenger seat beside our mother as she drove. And my mother rejected that instantly. And so Leroy proposed that he drive and that all of us sit in the back seat. <laughs> and I think I distinctly remember my mother saying, like most Southern women have said in, at least once in their lives, I'll have none of that. <laughs> and she said to Leroy, you're an adult, so you belong in the front seat, and it's my car, so I'm driving. 
The girls can sit in the back seat where they always sit. So at that point, Leroy, a black man, held his hat in his hands and he stared, I remember, he stared at the gravel for a moment and then he slowly and probably reluctantly climbed into the front passenger seat to sit beside my mother, a white woman. Perhaps Leroy was well aware of the risky situation my mother was putting us all in, especially him. White privilege would have my mother not even consider that. Perhaps he knew it would have been safer to do anything else but that. Leroy, our beloved family friend and my father's compadre, was right on both counts. As my mother drove the short distance into town, the glares from people in the cars beside of us were filled unmistakably with hatred and contempt. And when we stopped at a major intersection on Main Street in High Point, people on the sidewalks actually threw rocks at our car. As a four-year-old, I still remember it to this day, and I was baffled and frightened by the vitriol we encountered by the, this seemingly simple act. But it made very real the news stories I had seen on our little spaceship bubble television <laughs> and I had heard on the radio. I realized then why we were never allowed to stay for a visit at the home of Miss, Mr. Leroy and Miss Addie. Why we could only wave to their children from the car while our mothers exchanged dishes of new recipes they were trying and probably a, a little bit of car gossip from the car lot. I still couldn't fathom what it was about their skin that made them less than in the eyes of other people. Well, growing up and going to elementary school three years later, I felt equally perplexed that the Haley sisters and the Biddle family whose subsistence farms lay at just past the end of our road in the country could be treated any differently than me and my sisters. We came from the same area, the same neighborhood, and went to the same school, but something was different. And then as a teenager, I couldn't understand why the pastor of my own church made me sit in the balcony one Sunday evening worship with no lights on in the balcony, alone with my visitor, my best friend, Donna Smith, who happened to be African American. My heart still aches from the disparities, known and unknown, that my friends have lived with and suffered through on a daily basis simply because their skin was and is darker than mine. So fast forward 20 years ago, gosh, it's been a long time, 2004, long after those experiences of my youth, I was preparing to graduate from the School of Divinity at Wake Forest. Probably it was around this time of my final semester of Div School. I discovered the autobiography of a female minister by the name of Jarena Lee. Jarena Lee, who in 1819 
became the first woman ordained to preach in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And in 1836 was the first African American woman to have her autobiography published. Well, not long after studying the life and the, the writings of Jarena Lee, I also discovered something about myself. And I completed my seminary studies between surgery for breast cancer and treatments after I graduated. So the evening before our Divinity School class was to walk across that stage on Mother's Day Monday, uh, Monday like Wake always does, we celebrated a beautiful but solemn pudding ceremony in Wake Chapel. Judith, were, I don't know if you were there. I remember David Bills and Jean being there and most of all the people who had supported me for three years. And in that hooding ceremony, each student gets to choose a short reading that was somehow meaningful to them as part of that time of worship as we prepared for our individual calling to new horizons after seminary. Well, most of my colleagues chose a passage from the Judeo-Christian scriptures, but I chose to read a quotation from Jarena Lee's autobiography. It still gets me through rough times, and I have it the same index, 20-year-old index card on my desk at home. It was as if Jarena, a courageous and powerful minister, was reaching out from the past at just the right time to shine her light on my unknown and unfolding path. I had a lot more to consider for uh, my future, given my health, than my colleagues. Jarena, a, a black sister, sharing the wisdom from her own trials and her challenges, reassuring and blessing not only me, but others throughout the centuries. So in 1844, Jarena wrote, I have ever been fed by God's bounty. Clothed by God's mercy. Comforted and healed when sick. Succored when tempted. And everywhere held in God's hands. That's the one thing about a concussion, it'll make it cry. <laughs> this morning to me is just one moment out of all year that we can acknowledge the resilience and the strength and the enduring spirit of the African American community. And I want to call it African because it wasn't African American until late in the 20th century. As we continue to honor Black History Month, <coughs> let us reflect on the progress we have made as well as the work that still lies ahead of us. It's also an opportunity for each of us to examine our own hearts and our own minds to consider how is it that we can and we do contribute to a more just and equitable society. I feel like it's also audacious to ask you if you would pray with me, being that I don't know everyone's individual theology and how you define the mystery of life, but if you will, in your own way, join me in this prayer. Gracious creator of diversity and beauty, 
We offer our gratitude for the wide richness that our black brothers and sisters, our black grandmothers and grandfathers and cousins have woven into our collective journeys throughout the world, throughout history. Grant us the wisdom to recognize the inherent dignity and worth of every person regardless of their skin color, their background, or their life experiences. May the teachings and examples lived out for love and justice inspire us to be agents of positive change in our communities and around the world. Bless us with the strength to confront the challenges of inequality and prejudice. Let us walk hand in hand, recognizing the common thread of the Christ light that binds us together, weaves us together as one human tapestry. May your light and love shine brightly within us, leading us to the paths of understanding and empathy and in times of darkness, let us serve as beacons of your hope, extending kindness and understanding. And as we return to our individual lives, may the spirit of unity and compassion guide our actions in fostering a community of love, respect, acceptance, and actions that are a testament to values of justice and equality. We offer this benediction, trusting in your guidance and your grace. And so it is as we pray, amen.